Good morning and welcome. My name is Melinda Herring and I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. We're here today to discuss the Belarus crisis, Lukashenko's plane piracy. We are joined by four terrific experts. I have Ambassador Daniel Fried, the Weiser Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council and a long-serving U.S. diplomat. I have Ambassador John Herbst, the Director of the Eurasia Center. We have President uh, Tumas Ilves, the former president of the Republic of Estonia, and a, gr a great uh, a great voice on Twitter, and Hannah Lubakova, a non-resident fellow at our Eurasia Center in Washington. Uh, so earlier this week, uh, President uh, Lukashenko ordered a commercial jet uh, ground in Minsk. The plane was going from Athens to Vilnius, and there was a gentleman on board who is the co-founder and administrator at Nexta, which is the lifeline of the Belarus democracy movement. Roman Kristevich was taken off the plane and arrested, and he's in prison now. We're here to, we're gonna discuss this event and its implications. So let's jump into the, the conversation right away. Hannah, I, I, let me ask you this. What's the mood like within the democratic movement in Belarus right now after this news broke? Well, I think uh, uh, I should mention firstly that um, it uh, we all consider this a threat to both activists and uh, pro-democracy movement leaders who are based abroad, because Lukashenko has shown that he's not only ready to suppress the dissent inside the country, but also to um, arrest and uh, well threaten uh, those who are based abroad and kind of arrest people even in the sky. Um, at the same time, Belarus is back on the agenda, and um, the opposition has warned before that the situation would worsen, so it happened. Um, not only um, um, like those people, right, uh, inside the country are threatened, but also um, even bloggers, right? Um, the atmosphere of fear in Belarus um, has, um, how to say, ha has worsened, right? But this is not kind of the newest development. This is just part of what we have seen in the past months since August and since uh, even before the elections. Only last week, uh, the biggest um, media outlet in Belarus has, uh, was practically demolished and uh, a political prisoner died in prison because of a, a heart attack. At least uh, this was the official, uh, the official reason. So what the regime is trying to do, they're trying to detain everyone who is active. And only one month ago, deputy head of uh, the Ministry of Interior basically threatened that um, those people who are active would be found and would be um, detained, arrested, or uh, like they would be considered international terrorists. So I think we all kind of, uh, we are all under threat at the moment. Um, and it's important that the West would react um, in a kind of comprehensive way and uh, listen to, to, to the voices of the pro-democracy movement who actually were saying about something like this, uh, that something like this might, might happen. Thanks, Hannah. I, I'm curious about a couple of things. Do you think that, that uh, Lukashenko did this because there was an opportunity and he thought he could get away with it? Or do you think he's afraid? H how do you see the situation? Oh, I definitely see it as a sign of weakness because, well, somebody who is uh, confident about his position inside the country would not do this. Uh, he is very uncertain. He understands that he has lost the support of the people and he is in this mood that um, he needs to do everything to neutralize his enemies. Um, and uh, well, Raman became a very convenient target. He is a, a prominent blogger, prominent journalist who was um, um, co-founded this uh, prominent Telegram channel, the most influential one that was really important, played a key role during the protest. And that's some kind of a revenge, right, to, towards bloggers, but also towards um, everyone, again, who is kind of part of this pro-democracy movement, right? Um, and I'm quite confident that Lukashenko now understands that he has miscalculated. In a way, he didn't have a choice because now, because of the kind of Mm, lack of sufficient response, he felt uh, impunity. And because um, he feels so backed in the corner, he needs to constantly increase the level of fear, the level of repressions. 
And that's what we have been observing in the past months. If you if you kind of um, see what was happening, right, the demolition of this uh, media, uh, the largest media outlet, then uh, 3,000 criminal cases, then dozens of thousands of people who, who were detained, it all kind of a continuation of this. So this is this should be considered just in the context of what has happened in the past months. Absolutely. I think you're right that it needs to be viewed within that context. Um, tell us what's happening, though. We've been watching the crowd size diminish, right? The crowds were very large uh, last year around the elections. They were large for a long time. And then it got cold. Uh, and Minsk is very, very cold. And the, the crowd started to diminish. There was hope that the crowd size would expand uh, as the weather got nicer. Uh, and the crowds didn't, they weren't as large as they had been last year. What's happening now after the, the news of Ramon? Uh, well, the crowds disappeared because of the repression, because of the kind of level of repressions, not only because of the weather, um, because, well, it was just, and it still is too dangerous for people to come out to the streets and, and protest. But people um, still are against Lukashenko. They express their discontent in any way possible. They change the format. Um, they are still mobilized. They're still united. They are still self-organized. It's just kind of not that visible. And that's where the regime was successful. But it wasn't successful in convincing people kind of that um, uh, Lukashenko should stay in power. No, I think Belarusians uh, have decided that he has to go, right? Um, what happened with Roman provoked a lot of anger, a lot of frustration among the people. Uh, Belarusians do not believe in the official version, and obviously they do not believe that Hamas was involved in anything like that, um, as state media claimed. So um, people expect the reaction of the West, they respect this kind of tangible steps, tangible response from Western countries. Um, they also now, I think, um, kind of even those supporters of Lukashenko who were unconvinced or who were still kind of thinking way in options, now more and more people would consider him being too toxic um, and uh, kind of, more and more people are convinced that he has to go. So this could be a game changer. He may have completely overreacted and in fact um, caused, well, let's see. I mean, the situation is very fluid. Um, before I turn to our other panelists, uh, you're the only person on this panel who knows Ramon. He's 26 years old. He's very young. Uh, what is he like as a, as a human? We have to remember, you know, he's, he's a young man. Uh, he was living in exile. We know that he, his mother says he does have heart problems. Uh, is there anything else you can tell us about him? Sure. So, um, yeah, I know him for years. He was always active. He firstly, he, he was an activist when he was like 16 or 17. Uh, he was part of this revolution through social networks back then in 2011. Uh, so he always kind of was against Lukashenko, I would say, and he always wanted to take part in this opposition movement. Then he became a journalist, then he was a Václav Havel Journalism Fellow, um, as myself and as Ihar Vosik, who is currently in jail, as Frana Kvichorka, who is part of the uh, democratic movement. So, um, so yeah, so we are friends, we kind of, I knew that he was on the plane um, immediately, like, and when the plane was diverted, we immediately knew why. Uh, we were also shocked, but but then um, the fact that Roman was arrested, unfortunately, was not kind of a surprise for us. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of another step, another um, development that shows that Lukashenko considers bloggers and journalists, um, people generally who spread information as his own uh, like personal enemies. Um, and Roman was excellent. He was, um, you know, he was firstly editor in chief of um, uh, Next, the Telegram channel, the biggest one. Uh, later, he joined Belarus of the Brain, another Telegram channel. So he, he's been always like part of this, and he's, he he has done an amazing job when it comes to um, spreading information about regime lies and uh, what happened during the protest, police violence, um, this this type of things. Hannah, one last question for you: uh, the, What happened does not shut down Nexta. Nexta still operates. Is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, well, Roman, anyways, he left Nexta last year, so he joined another Telegram channel. Um, but nevertheless, when he he has already left Nexta, he was added to this terrorist uh, list by the KGB. So it doesn't really m kind of matter. It's not only about Nexta, it's about kind of everyone who, who is a blogger, who is active, who spreads information.
Wonderful. Thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, Ambassador Freed, uh, please give us a, a grade. How have the U.S. <clears throat> and the EU reacted? Are, are they doing a good job? Are you impressed by their response so far? I think the EU has acted with strength and speed that surprised a lot of people, including the EU. Um, the timing, Lukashenko's move was poorly timed. Um, there was a council meeting scheduled the very next day. So that was a senior move. Um, it was interesting to see the dynamic. The Poles and Lithuanians were out on, in front as early as Sunday, but that's to be expected. And those two governments are the strongest supporters of the Belarusian democracy movement on the ground. But they were joined very quickly by some, un not by the usual suspects. I noticed that a lot of French people regarded Lukashenko's move as an attack on Europe. There were exactly nine so. on the plane too. Well, but this was this was serious, and I think that many in Europe who believed that Lukashenko's dictatorship had nothing to do with them discovered their error. So this was this was solid work by the EU, and the U.S. reacted. We haven't taken action yet, but we supported the EU. And the language coming out of Washington has been strong and swift. I hope we follow up. We can't follow up exactly because Belavia, the um, Belarus Airlines, doesn't fly, in fact, fly to the United States. But I think US planes are staying out of Belarus airspace. I think they should be, I, I think they, they need to do so. That needs to be our policy. Um, we also, the US needs to consider its longer strengthening its longer term support for the Belarusian opposition. There are ways in which we can do this, but it's going to be a longer struggle. And we need to be, we need to be, we the US need to be in that game, working with our European friends. So I think we've done well so far. Oh, and the Russian, you know, the issue of Russia has yet to be determined. Okay, we don't know whether they were directly involved. We should look hard at that. But whether they were directly involved or not, Putin is Lukashenko's backer. And they, the Russian propaganda machine and Russian commentators tied to the government have been gleeful about this act of air piracy and this, this hijacking. So we need to be serious as we think of our Russia policy. We, in this case, being the United States and Europe because we need a common policy. Wonderful, thank you, Ambassador Freed. Uh, pr Mr. President, uh, what else should the EU do? And, and are you impressed with the action that they've taken so far? Let's start with this. I mean, we are dealing with an internal EU flight between two EU capitals on a plane or on an airline that is an EU airline and the plane is registered in the EU. So uh, this is an internal matter. I mean, this is the, the way to think about this is if you're flying from Boston to um, Seattle in the United States, you, you will cross over Canada. And it's if the Canadians suddenly took down the plane before, because there was there was someone on board they wanted to get. I mean, this would of course create a huge row. So, I mean, the, the point is that it's, it is completely an EU matter, and the EU had to react in a harsh way. Secondly, of course, uh, the fact that almost everyone on the plane was an EU national uh, uh, also plays into this, as we know that when you have. Uh, when you have a, uh, I mean, when Americans are involved, then of course the U.S. government immediately gets involved uh, when something like this happens. Uh, third of all, we're dealing with uh, basically uh, the imposition of, ec I mean, of a bizarre extraterritoriality that actually is part of a trend that. Uh, explicitly announced in different at different times in different places by both Lukashenko and Putin, which is that even if you are outside our territory, we will get you. 
which was explicitly said by Lukashenko and was explicitly said by Putin at other times. And in fact, they have. And this is part of a much larger tendency. Uh, I mean, we have the, the, the cases we know about more involving Russia, but I mean, Litvinenko's murder, uh, the attempted murder of Skripal, the shooting, uh, the, I mean, the assassination of a, a Chechen slash Georgian in Berlin, the, um, the uh, sabotage and explosion of the uh, Czech armory that resulted in the deaths of two people, and now this. Um, interestingly enough, or I, I, would, I would assert that in fact, um, uh, it was very easy for the EU to do this, much easier than it would have been for Russia. If you look at the response of the U European Union to murders perpetrated by Russia, it has been exceedingly weak. Belarus, on the other hand, is a worthwhile target. It is, it is, its population is small. It is of no consequence economically to the European Union. And so it was easy to kick the little dog. Um, if you com uh, compare the conclusions on Belarus with the conclusions on Russia that were part of the same meeting and which was the whole point of the meeting on Monday before already the, uh, the <clears throat> events on Sunday, uh, you see that, I mean, those conclusions were extraordinarily weak. So, um, so, the, so on the one hand, I'm glad the EU responded in a tough way. On the other hand, uh, it stands in stark contrast to uh, equally, if, and if not occasionally, more egregious behavior on the part of Russia, um, which in which various countries, be they Germany or, or Hungary recently, um, backpedaling, softening, uh, or even blocking positions critical of Russia. On Belarus, nah, every, I think everyone can say, okay, we'll go ahead and get them. So, it's uh, it's good, but it's not as good as we think. What what else would you like the EU to do? Well, I th I mean, first of all, I think we have to realize that this. I mean, whether or not, I mean, the, the, you can say the Russians were directly involved in this. I mean, there is a um, unit unified air command structure between Belarus and Russia. So to think that, in fact. Uh, Belarusian MiGs would uh, would rise up to basically threaten a civilian airliner is something that uh, the Russians knew nothing about or couldn't stop. That would be naive, I would say. Um, so I, I mean, I think we really have to see this as a as a tandem unit with a a uh, sort of. A little, a little wheel and a big wheel. And we don't want to look at the big wheel. Uh, we just want to look at the little wheel. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. We're getting some great questions. David Kramer has a, a wonderful question. Uh, glad to have you here, David. I'm going to give this to Ambassador Herbst. He says, shouldn't the G7 invite Svetlana Tikhanovskaya to its gathering? The French seem to support, but Brits, the hosts, oppose. And shouldn't President Biden meet with her separately while in Europe? Same could be said for Zelensky, by the way. Ambassador Herbst? David, um, that's a great question, and in fact, you you anticipated what I wanted to what I wanted to say. Um, I agree that the United States was wise to wait for the EU to respond first, beyond our our, our condemnation of this act of air piracy. But it is there are steps we could take, and one of those steps should be to invite Sihanouskaya to the United States, and to have a formal meeting with her in the White House, uh, maybe have her address Congress. And um, I think your idea of having her come to the G7 um, is a cherry on top of that Sunday. Yes, let's show Mr. Lukashenko that his, his, his uh, act of, of terrorism, which he thought was going to, to cap the end of the opposition movement, has in fact reinvigorated it. And I think important as well is Zan's suggestion of us increasing our assistance to the opposition um, financially to make sure that they get their message out and into Belarus. 
Thanks, Ambassador Herbst. Uh, one specific question for you and, and Dan, since you guys have been diplomats. What can the West do to get Ramon out of jail? Do you think the Russians will offer him in a swap deal in Geneva uh, when, when Biden and, and Putin meet? Is that a possibility? Um, th this is, this is a, it's almost a, a, a black humor situation. Uh, there, you know, the old, the old uh, dynamic in Soviet days, we, we, we would push on human rights. Uh, the Russians, of course, would not like that. But if they thought the relationship was moving in a direction that, that was favorable to them, they would offer us some concession by releasing a prisoner at one point or another. Um, sadly, Putin's policies have returned Russia to Cold War ways. And um, the United States finally, after years of not understanding what was going on, began to push back in a rather serious way, which has made the Kremlin uncomfortable. Uh, today, um, I think Putin is delighted that Biden has offered a summit. And I wouldn't rule out the possibility that Putin as a gesture to us I find a way to uh, arrange the release of Mr. Prokosevich in connection with, with the summit. Um, that would be a good thing. We want to get him out of jail, but it would also be sad because it points again to a return to old ways. Thank you. Uh, Dan, do you have any thoughts on that, on how to get Ramon out of jail? Don't let him be forgotten. Say his name, speak of him, speak of him often. The John's right, the Soviets liked to bury figuratively their dissidents before they could bury them physically. Don't let him be forgotten. And that does make a difference. The Kremlin calculates costs and benefits within its own peculiar framework in a rational fashion. And we should make this a big issue. There are lots of people being, a lot of political prisoners in Belarus. A lot of journalists being held unjustly, but such is the such is human nature that we focus on individuals and make them a metaphor for the larger issue. Don't forget anybody, but focus on him, his fiance, in particular, and keep that keep that there. Up, it's possible Putin would you know, come with a jet to Geneva with a gesture. Um, don't rule it out. More likely, he'll just say, look, Belarus is a sovereign country. You must deal with them. You know, butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. But we need to keep speaking of this. Um, there is a relationship between tyranny within a country and the tyrant's behavior abroad. That's an important lesson. Th thank you, Ambassador Freed. I think the Washington Post is doing an excellent job uh, of uh, keeping his name alive. The Atlantic Council will be as well. And we would welcome other partners. We would welcome anyone who's listening. Uh, if you want to have a private conversation about how we uh, can draw more attention to the case, please give me a call. Uh, Ambas Ambassador Herbst, I have a question for you. This is a little bit of, a, of a, an out there question. Is there a connection between, do you see a connection between the hijacking of the Ryanair flight and the Nord Stream 2 decision that President Biden recently made? Um, there's this clearly not a direct connection. But we, we, we've seen a funny, a funny um, move movement over the past um, six or eight weeks uh, in, in the Biden administration. President Biden came into office with a very clear-eyed view of Kremlin aggressive foreign policy and a need for the United States to push back against that aggressive foreign policy. Uh, he, he demonstrated real wisdom and strength in managing the Russian buildup of forces along Ukraine's border, uh, speaking out strongly in support of Ukraine and pushing back against the Kremlin. But the Nord Stream 2 decision was, in my judgment, a serious strategic error. It was done as a gesture to uh, Angela Merkel, a gesture that did not need to be given, but also proved to be a great concession to Mr. Putin. And we've gotten nothing back from either Germany or Russia for this extraordinary concession. That projects weakness. In Similarly, fact, the description, the description of, of the phone call between Jake Sullivan and Patricia talking about the United States' desire for predictability in the relationship with Russia, also projected weakness. Biden was right when he pushed back hard against Kremlin provocation and intimidation in Ukraine. That sent the right message to get ready for the summit in Geneva. Um, this statement of uh, the Patricia Sullivan call following the Nord Stream 2 decision, and by the way, the Nord Stream 2 decision was taken on the day of the Lavrov Lincoln meeting, 
which also suggests this was somehow a concession to Moscow, again, projecting weakness. I think that the Lukashenko decision, um, I, I can't imagine this does not discuss with Moscow in some fashion. I think the Lukashenko decision was taken on the basis that the reaction from the West would, would be weak. I think the EU is proving Lukashenko's considerations false. I hope the United States adds to that. So in that sense, there's a connection. Great, thank you, Ambassadors. Anna, a question for you. Why did Rahman fly over Belarusian territory? Uh, there, there was an old rule, rule in the, uh, the Cold War days that if you were a dissident, you would never fly over the Iron Curtain. It seems like a rookie mistake. We also know that he was being uh, photographed in Athens by some weird guy, uh, and he was texting his friends and saying, some weird man is taking my picture. Why on earth did he get on the airplane? Well, he was in Athens for personal reasons uh, with his girlfriend, Sofia Sapiega, and uh, it just coincided with the uh, uh, working visit of Svetlana Tikhanovska. So he took a few pictures of her uh, when he was there. And um, I think that's how he must have uh, been followed because they were kind of seen together. Um, and then he discussed, well, what I know is that he initially planned to travel outside the EU and then he was not recommended to do so. And then um, he was in the EU, in one EU country, traveling to another EU country. And how, how would you kind of envision this? Like, how would you foresee this, right? This is not the Cold War and kind of, um, I could not myself expect that uh, Lukashenko would do anything like that. And I think Roman was quite confident that he's not as wanted. Um, and um, also one week before he flew from Athens to Vilnius, Svetlana Tikhanovska took the same flight. So I think he was kind of confident that nothing would happen to him. Um, so, uh, so he discussed kind of safety issue, he discussed the airspace, and then he was perhaps kind of encouraged by, uh, by um, the fact that nothing happened with Svetlana Tikhanovska. But I only think that it's just, um, um, well, perhaps security services uh, of, uh, of Belarus uh, were not prepared to, to do the same with uh, Svet Svetlana Tikhanovska's plane because that was kind of last minute decision. And then they, uh, they just uh, were prepared better. Um, and uh, again, that was a signal, right? So it could have been anyone. It's not only about Roman Pratasevich, this is about like anybody, right? Everybody who is part of the pro-democracy movement or associated with um, either um, leadership in exile or, uh, bloggers, you know, journalists. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, has, let me ask one more obvious question. Uh, have you guys thought through this and hardened your security posture? Uh, you know, this could happen to anyone. Um, are, are, is anyone associated with the movement, independent journalists? Are you guys all reconsidering your travel now and, and thinking through what this means? Oh yes, absolutely. Well, it, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fly through uh, the Belarusian airspace, and um, because uh, you know anything can happen, right? Your plane might it, it might not be a special operation of the Belarusian regime of the Belarusian government, but uh, you know anything might happen. So I kind of uh, considered this as well uh, before what happened to Roman, but I think now. Um, everybody would do the same, right? They would take some uh, kind of safety measures, safety precautions more seriously. Yeah. And this is something that should have been done before, obviously. Um, but now, well, uh, we, we, we all kind of have to reconsider how, um, how we live, basically how we function here um, in the EU, you know, abroad. Um, obviously, you know what happened around a month ago when two um, a Belarusian citizen and a US citizen traveled to Moscow and they were detained by the by the Russian FSB. Um, so that was kind of the first step that the regime has taken, like to show that um, everybody can be targeted and it's not safe for, for anyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm relieved to hear that. Uh, Mr. President, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to make two separate points. One on this issue is that, and this is uh, made by um, uh, Andrei Sanikov the other day, the, uh, a, uh, a former presidential candidate who was jailed and who was released in, I guess, 2011, 2012, only because of Western pressure. The point is, if, if Lukashenko gets away with this, it's not simply Lukashenko. It really is. It, it says that uh, overflights are now um, 
or no open open game. I mean that you can actually that this is this is not just this is not Lukashenko. Other countries can do this too. Be it Turkmenistan can do it, and uh, Myanmar can do it. Uh, and so this has. I mean this is. Uh, I mean this is not only terrorist terrorism and um, uh, and hijacking. I mean, this goes back to the uh, casus belli of the War of 1812, when the British Navy, when with letters and privateers with letters of mark, were taking U.S. citizens off American ships, and it led to a war. I'm not advocating war here, but uh, this must be met with ver a very strong response so that no one thinks that this is something that is a new form of, uh, of policy. The other thing, just to go back to what I was saying before about when, you said that, well, do we see a change in Germany? Uh, yesterday, the co-chair of the Greens said that if they come into power, they would like, they would sell um, military hardware to Ukraine. To which the government spokesman quickly rebutted and said that Germany does not sell military hardware to conflict areas or crisis areas. Krisegebiete. That's nice. Well, in that, I mean, <laughs> Russia is a party to that crisis and that zone of crisis. And so, I mean, we see that the, uh, the response of the Merkel government continues to be completely disingenuous. And at a time when in fact, German arms uh, companies are selling arms to rather dubious regimes in the Gulf where, okay, there may not be uh, <laughs> crisis zones, but they are certainly countries that have a very dubious record on human rights compared to say Ukraine. So I don't think that, I mean, I, I, we, I think we have to be aware that, um, not, that we should not overpraise the EU response in that, as I said earlier, it is an easy response because it's a little country that, is, is, that you can be forceful with as opposed to actually taking a principal stand on the government that ultimately enables this kind of behavior. Thank you, Mr. President. I think you put your finger on something really important. I, I would also urge everyone to read the Washington Post article that came out about two months ago. The president of Freedom House, uh, Mike Abramovitz, wrote an article about that th th discusses this in a lot of detail, that there are no more safe havens for dissidents, for people like Hannah for uh, people like Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. It doesn't matter where you are. Uh, authoritarian regimes can get you anywhere. Uh, Ambassador Freed, you wanted to jump in. Please go ahead, sir. I wanted to express my profound agreement with what Professor President Ilba said. Tyranny in a country doesn't stop just in that country. We have watched Putin's agents assassinate people they don't like outside of Russia. We have seen Russian aggression touch the United States and touch Europe. We have seen in recent weeks a military buildup, a Russian military buildup against Ukraine. We have seen a hack on a critical piece of US infrastructure, the colonial pipeline emanating from Russia, though not the, not the Russian government, so says the US administration, but from Russia. Um, I agree that the, Ger the, the German Greens have a much stronger Russia policy than the SPD and the current Ger German government. Uh, the French supported the strong reaction and Macron has spoken in terms of um, dealing with Putin's aggression. I think the US and the EU need to consult in a serious way about upping our game. That doesn't mean not cooperating with Russia when it's in our interest. That doesn't mean that we don't want to stabilize the relationship, but let's recognize that for the foreseeable future, as long as Putin does what he does, resisting Russian aggression is going to be the largest pillar of the bilateral relationship. And Putin is Lukashenko's backer. I don't know whether he, had, he was involved in um, the uh, Sunday's hijacking, but Lukashenko enjoys Putin's protection. 
um, let's prove President Ilvis's skepticism wrong by having a stronger transatlantic policy. And I think we're poised to do it. Um, I'm not as down as President Ilvis on the council conclusions about Russia. Um, there is the, the basis for a stronger EU policy. And I think that with US consulting with Europe, we could get there. We need, the US needs to rally like-minded people around a strong and sustainable uh, policy to deal with Putin. And I think that the, this air hijacking business um, is, you know, may trigger um, a reassessment of a comfortable status quo. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, it is time for our questions. We call this blitz round. So get ready, ladies and gentlemen. I have a number of questions uh, to our Zoom audience. If you haven't submitted yet, please go ahead and do that. You can also submit on Twitter and I'll be glad to uh, direct your question uh, to one of our four excellent panelists. First question is from Jana, and this is to Hannah Lubakova. What do you think uh, will be the next steps of the Belarusian regime? Um, well, because they, again, like they're so backed in the corner, they have to increase repressions and increase the, the fear. So I think that that's something that would would be happening uh, right after they arrested, um, demolished, stood by and arrested more journalists um, uh, from, from that media outlet. Um, only a few days ago, they also kind of uh, took hostage of um, um, of other journalists who were part of the the same uh, kind of network, the same media corporation. Then they attacked, uh, raided offices of Belsa TV, of the studio in Minsk. Um, yesterday, they arrested a member of the Coordination Council in Minsk. So it all continues, and because again, they have to show that um, you know they basically are ready to suppress uh, the dissent in any way possible, more and more would be happening, more repressions would, would follow. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Tom Firestone, it's great to have you with us, Tom says, he's, he's a great lawyer, he says, the US has a criminal statute against air piracy that applies extraterritorially if US citizens were on the plane. I understand there were US citizens on the plane. I assume that Poland, Lithuania, and other countries have similar statutes. Do you think that there is any chance that the US or any other country will bring criminal charges against Lukashenko or others who were involved in this act. It seems that there are good arguments um, that head of state immunity would not apply in this case. I, I, I don't think I have any lawyers on this, but uh, Ambassador Herbst- There are no Ambassador, US citizens on the plane. No US citizens, none. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you, sir. Okay, next question, that was easy. Uh, this is a question for John from uh, Bogdan Nihilo in Kiev, Ukraine. Hi, Bogdan, it's great to have you here. He says, greetings, Washington allows Berlin off the hook with Nord Stream 2. NATO does not invite Ukraine to its summit, a sign of greater appeasement to come. Can we trust Biden to be firm enough with Putin? Oh, um, you know, again, Biden ran for presidency and in his first couple of months in office, demonstrated a clear-eyed understanding of Putin's aggressive foreign policy and the need for the United States to push back. But I've already expressed some concern about the Nord Stream 2 decision. I agree with you, Bogdan. It was a disaster. Um, and again, the characterization of US policy towards Moscow um, in recent days has also been troublesome. Um, I suspect that Biden's better instincts will kick in before he gets to Geneva, and we'll see a reassertion of the, the realism that has, the proper realism that has characterized his approach. But I think it's important for us to make clear the problems of his approach over the last couple of weeks. And I think coming back to Nord Stream 2, it's important for Senate Democrats to stand up and insist that Biden do what Congress asked him to do. Uh, Democrats criticized Mitch McConnell as Moscow Mitch for not opposing Trump more firmly when Trump was trying to play nasty games with Ukraine. But McConnell, in fact, insisted that, that Trump provide military assistance to Ukraine. And Republican Democrats supported Ukraine and American interests when Trump was going off on a bad road. We need to see Democrats in the Senate do the same now as Biden is heading in the wrong direction on Nord Stream 2. Thank you, Ambassador Herbst. Okay, question for Mr. President. Uh, Paul Nyland, a good friend of ours from Kiev, says, the, uh, you make a good point that most passengers were EU citizens, which leads me to ask, do we know what the orders of the MiG pilot were? Had the crew not complied with the order to divert to Minsk? Does anyone know, was he authorized to use force? We don't know. 
but we don't know. We do, uh, we do have past experience and a major, major scandal from back when I was an ambassador in the United States in 1994, I guess, was when a, a hot air balloon race was in Poland. And in fact, there had been a notification that given the winds, they might, these, play, these hot air balloons might fly into, um, into Belarus territory and showing the amazing courage of uh, Lukashenko in 1994 already, he ordered his eight MiGs to shoot them down, killing, I guess, three or four Americans. I do have one bit of news that just came out, which is that Russia is upping the game right now. Russia bans European airlines from entering Russian airspace as long as EU airlines do not fly to Russia via Belarusian airspace. Air France and Austria are affected until now. Their flights to Moscow have been canceled, say, says Tutbi, Tutbi, however you pronounce that. In any case, it looks like they're escalating uh, this and Russia is certainly really coming down on the side of Belarus on this. So there's a stronger linkage than there was in the first half hour of our discussion. Thank you. Thanks for that update. Uh, David Kramer. If the Russians want to involve themselves in a civil air escalation with Europe, they, would be, they should remember the 1980s, a period of Cold War escalation, which ended badly for Moscow. If they escalate, we should not back down. I hesitated to recommend extending civil aviation penalties to Russia because their involvement with Lukashenko's hijacking was not demonstrated. But if this report is true, and I had heard some, I had heard about an Air France flight to Moscow being banned yesterday, but I hadn't heard about this latest. If that's true, then Moscow is putting itself on the side of air piracy and against a rules-based system. And we ought to draw conclusions and we should not back down. Wonderful, thank you. David Kramer says that we're, we are wrong and that there are three dual Lithuanian American citizens on the flight. So Tom Firestone's question um, might apply then. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone wants to to to, uh, to answer that. No, okay. Oh, actually, Melinda, I'll, I'll jump in. If, if in fact there are Americans on the plane, and David usually has his facts correct, um, then I think Tom Firestone's idea is, is the right one. Um, there's there's no reason why we should not go after Lukashenko on this basis. But I, I'd like to also comment on this the report regarding uh, Russian uh, air airspace. Uh, Moscow has one advantage here because it has a great deal of airspace being the largest country in the world. But Dan is exactly right that if Russia is heading down this point, this direction, then they've clearly lined up behind Lukashenko um, and the West must respond strongly. And this comes back to what President um, Yildiz said, that in fact, the EU will have to respond if it's serious to this latest Moscow provocation. And that also brings back the wisdom of Dan's point. If in fact, the West stands strong we need to remember that Moscow ultimately is the, uh, is the, is oversees a rather weak economy. And so when it comes to economic sanctions and what can be done, the whip hand is held by the United States and the EU. So we can go down this road and, and win. But the EU would then have to demonstrate the sort of strength vis-a-vis -vis Moscow that we have yet to see. Well, but John's completely right. And I would add something. When I was in my old job of sanctions coordinator, I talked to businesses. After, this was after the, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. I talked to businesses about the risk of doing business with Russia when Putin was in command and in an aggressive mood. But nothing I said sends as powerful a message as the Russian government themselves making it hard to fly to Moscow. Okay, so what Western businessmen is going to take the risk of, of new investment in Russia when suddenly his or her ability to go to Moscow and come home has been put at risk by Kremlin aggression. This is not going to help Russia and it's going to make 
it's going this kind of self isolation is going to end badly for them and we need not we need not back down even though john's right about russian overflights making oh, denial of overflight permission making airlines jobs harder if they are denying travel to moscow then we should draw conclusions and it won't end well for them and in fact if moscow is doing this how in the world can biden go to geneva fly to geneva for a meeting and for that matter how can germany consider proceeding with Nord Stream 2. They will consider proceeding with Nord Stream 2, but I think this, this would put pressure on Biden not to go to Geneva. Well, I just point out that in 2008, having negotiated a six point deal in Georgia uh, for, that called for the removal of Russian troops from uh, the areas they had invaded, um, uh, or else the, uh, the, the whatever it was, the agreement that the EU had with Russia would be suspended. Uh, a month later, the man who organized or who negotiated that deal, uh, <clears throat> uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, leading the EU, then, then trashed that and said, thank God common sense prevailed regarding an agreement that he himself had negotiated. So. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not convinced that the that uh, that the EU will not climb down. I mean, after the European Union uh, head of foreign policy uh, called it called the uh, the sabotage of an arms uh, repository in the Czech Republic a uh, uh, a disruptive action when in fact two people were killed in it. I don't think, I mean, I'm not, I mean, as being an EU, not an, a citizen, not an American citizen, my experience has been somewhat um, <clears throat> less than uh, happy in this regard. Thank you so much. Okay, this is another question for you, Mr. President. Could restricting or banning flights to and from Minsk be counterproductive? Does this not risk further isolating the Belarusian people? given one of the only routes out is flight, um, if, if flights are banned to Russia. It is not the case that enhanced border security and controls on the movements are beneficial for Lukashenko. And Hannah, happy to have you weigh in too. Well, at this point, from what I understand, at least you can, you can leave by car. Correct, correct. So, I mean, uh, yeah. I don't know. Go ahead, Hannah. Uh, no, no, just wanted to confirm that this, uh, yeah, it's still possible to uh, to to leave the country by car, um, though it will definitely affect people who want to flee and who want to flee by uh, by 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 aircraft by plane. So um, so that's um, that's something to consider and keep in mind. However, I mean there are costs in it. I mean that's something that. Um, People, well, people understand why it happened. This is not because the EU wants to punish Belarusians, but because of what happened and because Lukashenko has become a threat to, to the regional security, to, the, to European security. Um, at the same time, also, well, those kind of uh, bans would affect uh, Belavia and would affect the... Um, uh, the government because, uh, because of this kind of um, revenue that is coming from transit. So this is something that is going to affect the economy, right? And kind of, um, uh, uh, how to say, cut uh, cut finances for of the regime. Thanks, Hannah. I, could, yeah, I would. I mean, the EU could also do something such as ban all commercial tra uh, trucking coming through uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, the three countries that border Belarus and the EU. Okay. And not not touch individual cars, but but certainly not allow trucks in. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Ambassador Freed, question for you. Are there any meaningful sanctions that can be imposed on Belarus through the International Civil Avi Aviation Organization or through the International Air Transport Administration? Um, I don't have a lot of faith in ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization to take swift action. Okay. Um, I know the US administration is looking at that and so is the EU, um, don't hold your breath. I think that the EU's action to ban flights from, um, from Belarus, Belavia flights, and to ban its own carriers from going or to or transiting Belarus is the right one. That's a strong step. There may be additional sanctions possible in other areas. Um, 
As far as additional civil aviation, not sure, not sure. Okay, thank you, sir. A uh, question for Ambassador Herbst. Uh, the narrative about Ramon keeps changing in the Belarusian media. And uh, one of our attendees says that, that we've seen evidence of Ramon's involvement with the far right Azov, uh, Azov Brigade in Ukraine, including photos of him in military uniform, holding a weapon and other photos with him wearing Nazi symbols. Uh, can you comment on those claims? And Hannah, uh, I'd love to have you comment as well. Look, every time Moscow finds itself in an uncomfortable situation regarding its aggression in Ukraine, it trots out the, the, the myth of, of overweening far-right extremists in Ukraine, including the Azov Battalion. Uh, we know that in Ukraine, as in all countries, there is a far-right element. We also know in Ukraine it's a very small element and has almost no impact on policy. So this is just a typical, typical bit of Russian disinformation. And you know, um, the, the Kremlin has many centuries of practice of creating false pictures and false documents in order to pursue foreign policy objectives. Wonderful. Hannah, any other thoughts? Sure. So uh, I would add that uh, what Raman was saying, and, and he told me that he was in both Maidan and Donbass, but he was saying that he was a war photographer. That's what he did there. Um, and that's something I think that Azov, um, uh, this battalion, Ukrainian battalion, confirmed. So um, let's kind of look at the timing, uh, why this information came out only now in 2021, not before. And there have been a few years, right, uh, since then. And um, I just saw the news that a um, has initiated a criminal case against uh, Raman for his alleged involvement. Again, right, this is like, let, let's look at the timing. Why, why is it happening only now? Exactly, exactly. Hannah, uh, I have another question for you. Uh, one of our attendees wants to know, what can I as a regular citizen do to help the movement in Belarus, the democratic movement in Belarus and journalists there? Well, I think it's important. It was already mentioned. Um, Belarus should be on the agenda. Raman's case should be on, on the agenda. Only uh, when um, there was um, this news about him being in a hospital, uh, the security forces, uh, the US pro government TV ch um, telegram channel released a video of him. So because of this pressure, because of the, this kind of constant focus and attention on Raman and his health and his um, life, basically, and kind of uh, his condition, uh, the Belarusian regime would be um, obliged uh, to, uh, well, to share at least information about how he feels, right, and what his health is. And it applies to everyone else who is now behind bars, who is now behind um, in prison. Belarus should be on the agenda, and Belarus should be um, also a priority, right? So concrete steps um yeah solidarity attention um there are a lot of fundraisers where you can donate money to um to help journalists to help the victims of repressions um so kind of many many things uh, can um many yeah. steps can be taken so th this is a question for ordinary people um I, I know that there was a campaign to write letters can ordinary people send a note to ramon in prison uh, would that be helpful Yes, that will be definitely helpful. Uh, and um, many political prisoners and general prisoners say that uh, they are waiting for, for those letters. They're waiting for postcards. That's how they know that they are not um, exactly. forgotten because they are completely isolated in prison. Well, how, how do we do that? Where, where can we go? Um, people who are watching, what website should they go to? So uh, there is this human rights organization, Vesna. Um, spring96.org, um, and they post uh, addresses. Of political okay, could, you, could you put that down in the chat for everyone who's watching so that we can uh, we can do our own part? Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, I have a question, another good question from our friend Bogdan Nahilo in, in Kiev. He wants to know, he's annoyed, he says, is the piecemeal approach to Russian aggression and the reassertion of autocracy and Russia imperialism obsolete and ineffective? He says, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Georgia, hybrid warfare, against Europe. Is it not time to convene a broad 1975 uh, um, CSCE conference between East and West to reaffirm the ground rules and where the red lines are? Uh, Ambassador Herbst, Ambassador Freed, uh, Mr. President, who wants to take that one on? I'll go first. Uh, I, I agree with Bogdan that there has been a piecemeal approach by the West to serial Kremlin aggression. But it's also true that the West has gotten better and smarter over time. Certainly, our reaction to what the Kremlin did in Georgia was inadequate. President Ilves pointed out the inadequacy, especially of Sarkozy's 
allowing Russia to get away with uh, abandoning its commitments. But it's also true that while um, our response, the West response to Crimea was not very good, the response to Donbass, while not outstanding, was a good bit better. So we've seen a greater understanding of the need to push back against Kremlin aggression, not a strong enough understanding. Your notion of having a, uh, a European-wide conference on this is interesting. It could also play into Moscow's um, long-stated interest in revising the rules of the post-Cold War order. Um, perhaps for that reason, I'm a little bit skeptical of the approach, but I would say the approach first must be of a strong, strong policy standing up to Kremlin aggression. And once we've established that as a consistent policy, then we talk to Moscow about the rules of the game. Wonderful. Uh, gentlemen, any, any other comments? No? Okay. Wonderful. Uh, another good question. How can Germany be influenced to become a team player at this changing time? Seems that even Macron is vexed with Berlin's uh, scarcely concealed arrogance. I think that's a, a question for Ambassador Herbst. Uh, I, I would not talk of German arrogance, but, but I certainly believe that the Nord Stream 2 uh, project is a disaster for the West. Uh, not just because it will enable Moscow to put oil, excuse me, put gas uh, where it wants and to put pressure on the countries of Eastern Europe, but all, and also to give them a wider range of military options in its war against Ukraine in the East and Donbass, but also because it strengthens relations between the German business community and the Kremlin. And it turns that German business community into apologists for Putin. You know, um, the, the one political word that will emerge from this period in history is Putin for Stare, as surely as Quislings emerged from World War II. And that phrase, Putin for Stare, is not a, a mark of honor for Germany. And Nord Stream 2 project is the project of the Putin for Stairs. And it is not in the interest of the West that um, a strong country of Germany, an important ally for the United States, has a nest of Putin for Stairs of influence in Germany. Okay. I want to add to this, um, start by agreeing with what John said, but there's more. The, the Biden administration has taken a huge hit because it seemed to take a step back from its resistance to Nord Stream 2. The German foreign minister, for the first time ever, acknowledged that there are strategic risks with Nord Stream. The German government needs to step up and address those risks in a serious way, working with the stakeholders. And the Biden administration, I hope, has some better understanding of German intention to do that, um, which could explain their forbearance. Um, I hope so, because they're getting killed. The Poles, and, the Poles, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, and others, including the German Greens, are right in their criticism of Nord Stream 2. What do we do about it? We need to address those problems and not pretend they don't exist. And, okay. If, Ambassador Fried, I want to get one more question to you, if, if you don't mind, I was already cut you off. Um, are you in favor of more hard hitting sanctions against SOEs uh, that would have more of an economic impact than sanctions against individuals close to Lukashenko? I'd love to be able to identify the places where Lukashenko and his cronies have their money. If it's not in Europe, it might be outside Belarus. Let's try to identify it and go after it and expose it, okay? Now, so that's one thing we could do, um, go after the money. Second, the, the issue of economic sanctions is something with pluses and minuses, and, and we need to listen to the Belarusian opposition. But one thing we, that I've considered is um, banning uh, sale of additional Belarus state debt, state bonds. I don't see why they should be able to make money in, off the West, raise capital in the West, while they're busy engaging in air piracy. Um, we ought to be able to do that. We've, the Biden administration has already um, taken beginnings of such steps with respect to Russian debt. Um, we could do so with respect to Belarusian debt, at least. Wonderful, thank you. Hannah, you have the last word. Bring us home. Uh, if I may actually uh, add here, I would say that, uh, well, firstly, um, 
Belarus is already dependent on Russia economically, politically, and uh, militarily in many other ways. So this argument that is going to be more dependent, um, it might actually have sense, but then uh, this is something that Lukashenko has been trying to, to show, like to convince uh, his Western partners that uh, if sanctions are imposed, then Lukashenko, then the Belarusian economy would go uh, you know, to, to Russia. And it already did. If already state-owned enterprises are already dependent on the Russian market, so there is basically I'm wondering whether there is a room for for this uh, kind of getting even more dependent. Um, sanctions should be uh, more targeted, should be more thought, should be more painful. Uh, the uh, state-owned enterprises might be sanctioned because this is something that um, they are being controlled by the regime and the funds. Uh, the revenue is being misused anyway. Um, the extent to which Moscow is prepared to prop up Lukashenko is unclear because Lukashenko is going to be, uh, it's becoming more and more toxic for, for, for Russians, for Putin. And the more costly this kind of union, this friendship um, is becoming, the more Russia has been accused of supporting Lukashenko and Minsk um, actions, um, kind of the louder those voices uh, opposing this support uh, would be um, um, among the Russian elites. Wonderful. Thank you, Hannah. Mr. President, you get the final, final remark. Go ahead. This is important. I mean, this is something that needs to be taken up. Uh, in an interview, uh, Jakob Wollenstein, uh, the head of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Minsk, uh, said, quote, we have names of thousands of police officers, judges who make political judgments, interior ministry employees, riot police officers that have violated human rights. And he says he should, they should all be aware they could face entry bans and an investigation. But if, I mean, if the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, which is the foundation of CDU, has this, then this should these should be implemented. I mean, if you have thousands of all of these criminals, then make sure none of them ever cross into any borders. And so too with the the, the uh, people that I'm sure we'll soon find out from Bellingcat who were involved in the hijacking. Thank you, sir. An excellent point. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Thank you for sticking with us. I know we went a little bit over. Your homework is to go down to the chat and click on that link that Hannah posted. And please don't forget the Belarusian opposition. There are hundreds of people in jail. They would love to hear from you. Thank you for joining the Atlantic Council. Until next time, and thank you to our fantastic panel. Really appreciate your insight and learned a lot. Goodbye. Thank you.